on this Tuesday night. In this new year, a new horizon in space exploration. I, I don't know about all of you, but um, I'm really liking this 2019 thing so far. <laughs> NASA's furthest flyby ever, how it helps us understand the universe and how Canada contributed to this mission. There's no chance that the Russians are making an accurate accusation. The twin brother of an American detained on espionage charges says they've got the wrong guy. Is Paul Whelan the victim of Russian retaliation? The monarchy might not survive the reign of King Charles III. Prince Charles at 70, a lifetime of waiting, giving way to an uncertain future. This is The Night. New Year's Day is a time we think about what the future holds, and so it seems fitting, just 33 minutes into 2019 Eastern Time, the New Horizon spacecraft was at the edge of our solar system, hurtling past the most distant object ever to be explored by humankind. Have you seen this before? Yeah. This was the scene inside NASA's mission control about 10 hours later. When scientists finally received the confirmation, the flyby was a success. New Horizons came within 3,500 kilometers of Ultima Thule, a tiny, icy object about six and a half billion kilometers away. Among those scientists celebrating today's achievement, a team of Canadians whose work was critical. Chris O'Neill Yates has more on the mission and its impact here on Earth. Blink and you'd have missed it. The first flyby lasted about two seconds at 14 kilometers a second. Among those at Johns Hopkins Laboratory when it happened was Canadian scientist JJ Kevlars. Today is amazingly important. This is like an incredible, incredible feat, right? Uh, I have been working, uh, in trying to understand this process of how planets form uh, for about 20 years now. Kevlar says the work of Canadian researchers was critical. They built a model of the outer solar system that was used to plot New Horizons' path. Now that it's there, it will take about two years for all the images to be beamed back to Earth. And we just go, it's like, you know, you maybe see people at sporting events where they take their camera and they just press the shutter and they swing it past, hoping they catch something. And basically that's what we're doing. We will have insight, first-hand insight into the material from which we formed. Astronomy professor Paul Delaney has been monitoring New Horizons every move. This is a big day. It's a piece of the past that will allow us to not only understand our present, but project forward into the future with a little bit of luck. Today's excitement wasn't lost on visitors to Vancouver's H.R. McMillan Space Center. Learning about how planets are formed, learning about the origins of our solar system and universe, it's, um, it's a great time to, to be interested in science and research. I really want to know if there's more life out there. For every you know, young scientist out there, th just think this could be them for the next great discovery 10, 20, 30 years from now. So to me, this is not just science and technology, this is humanity's future. Brett Gladman published a paper this month on the craters on Ultima Thule. This timing could not be better. I'm totally fascinated to see what's going to be happening over the coming weeks as the spacecraft imagery dribbles in. As far away as all this is, Kevlar says missions like this help to improve life back here on Earth. For instance, you know, the Internet that we use today and that everyone, basically, our, our lives depend on the Internet now. New Horizons will continue its work until 2030 when it runs out of fuel, giving scientists a full decade of discovery to look forward to. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Vancouver. And New Horizons is the first of many history-making missions set to take place in 2019. This month, China's new lander rover could become the first ever to touch down on the far side of the moon. We're also expecting SpaceX and Boeing to ferry American astronauts to the International Space Station. The U.S. has relied on Russia to do this since 2011. And this year could also be big for space tourism. Blue Origin, owned by Amazon's Jeff Bezos, and Virgin Galactic, owned by the billionaire Richard Branson, are promising to make big strides in launching civilians into weightlessness. On to other news now, and we're learning more tonight about an American man born in Canada, detained in mysterious circumstances in Russia. Paul Whelan was arrested on Friday by Russian state security, accused of espionage. He's a former U.S. Marine, but his twin brother says there is no way he's a spy. Ron Charles has more from Washington. 
a photo from one of Paul Whelan's early trips to Russia during leave when he was a U.S. Marine serving in Iraq sometime between 2003 and 2010. It was during his latest of several trips to Moscow that Russia's Federal Security Service, the FSB, arrested him on accusations of espionage, which can carry a sentence of up to 20 years in prison. From his home just outside Toronto, David Whelan explains that his twin brother was born in Ottawa, but has lived almost all of his life in the U.S. and is an American citizen. He says Paul was in Russia last week for a wedding. He went to Russia on the 22nd to attend a wedding of a friend of his and the friend had asked him to come because Paul's visited Russia in the past. David Whelan says his family is in touch with the U.S. State Department, which has requested consular access to Paul, also a former police officer, now director of corporate security for a multinational auto parts maker. The FSB hasn't explained the nature of the alleged spying. It's the sort of personality that you wouldn't expect to be a lawbreaker of any sort, let alone someone who's you know, breaking uh, spy laws. Um, it's just it's inconceivable to all of us that he could be considered a spy. Some security experts are linking Whelan's case to that of Maria Butina. She pleaded guilty in the U.S. last month to conspiring to act as an agent for the Kremlin, in part by infiltrating the National Rifle Association to influence U.S. politics during the 2016 election campaign. As she awaits sentencing in custody, Butina has become a cause celeb on Russian social media, her case chilling relations between Russia and the U.S. But David Whelan says he doesn't know whether the Russians picked up his brother in retaliation for Butina's arrest. Uh, I think it's too complicated to come up with a simple answer to what that is. Um, I think that there are many reasons that Paul could have, uh, and it could be completely arbitrary. Um, our goal really is just to get him home. His family is hoping U.S. officials and the lawyer can visit Paul Whelan tomorrow, the end of a traditional 72-hour blackout in such arrests. Ron Charles, CBC News, Washington. While millions of people around the world celebrated the New Year, there were three attacks in different cities with what appear to be very different motives. In Manchester, England, a man attacked revelers with a knife. Today, investigators raided the suspect's home in the city's north end. Police arrested him last night after a stabbing spree on a train station platform. Three people were hurt, a transit police officer and a couple in their 50s. The wounds not believed to be life-threatening. Police say witnesses heard the attacker shout Islamic slogans. In Germany, foreigners appeared to be the target of a man who drove his car into crowds celebrating the new year. He hit four people, including a Syrian and Afghan. Their injuries are described as severe. And there was a similar attack last night in Tokyo. At least nine people were hurt when a man rammed a van into a crowd in a popular shopping district. The street had been closed to traffic and was packed with pedestrians. The 21-year-old suspect reportedly told police he was avenging the deaths of members of a doomsday cult. They were executed in July for a sarin gas attack on the Tokyo subway in 1995. In Britain, some people are welcoming 2019 with excitement about Brexit. For others, there's a sense of dread, and no one knows for sure if Britain will leave the European Union as planned. The CBC's Barry Stewart spoke with people celebrating the New Year today in London. It's become a tradition in London. Hundreds of thousands line up in the chilly January air for the annual New Year's parade. A chance to take in the marching bands from all over the world and look ahead to the new year. I just want peace and for everybody to get along together. New Year's is a time to celebrate, but there's no doubt that 2019 is going to be a pivotal year for the UK. It's poised to leave the EU at the end of March, but there's a lot of uncertainty around how that will actually work and what the consequences will be. Not to mention the public is still deeply divided over Brexit. Well, I voted to leave, <laughs> without a doubt, so, uh, but lots of my friends voted to stay, um, which is obviously nice little arguments all the time. But as far as I'm concerned, Britain can stand on its own two feet. Yeah, I'm hoping yeah. they'll stay in the EU, yeah. They're not coming out. It's, it's been too, you know, it's been going on too long now, and I think really if we come out, we could be in, we might be in a few dire straits. There has been countless warnings about what could happen if the UK leaves the EU without an agreement. That appears possible because the deal Theresa May has is still very unpopular. 
She put off a vote on it in December over fears it would be rejected, but she's promised to put it to Parliament the second week of January. It is a hugely tricky situation. She doesn't have the majority in Parliament for it. That said, though, we haven't had the crucial vote that would say she's completely lost that, that she's lost the deal and must go. So she's still hanging on in there. In the Prime Minister's New Year's message, she pleaded for the country to unite. If we come together in 2019, I know we can make a success of what lies ahead and build a country that truly works for every one of us. There's likely little chance we'll see such unity. The opposition's New Year's message sounded like a political attack ad. The Conservatives have plunged the country into crisis. All of it adds up to a fractured parliament and what will be a few tumultuous months to begin the new year. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Here at home, the divisive federal carbon tax is now in effect. Ottawa has imposed the tax on a handful of holdout provinces. It's already being challenged in court, but as Olivia Stefanovic tells us, the true test may come in October's federal election. Welcome to the year of the carbon tax. First on the agenda for 2019, Conservative leader Andrew Scheer calls a news conference to issue a warning. Everyday essentials will become more expensive this year thanks to the Trudeau carbon tax. Starting today, Ottawa is imposing a tax on fossil fuel in provinces that don't have one. Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario and New Brunswick. Big industrial emitters will start paying first if their emissions are over a certain limit. Then in April, consumers will start seeing higher prices for gas, heat and food that has to be transported but they'll also receive rebates to offset the increases. This expert says the plan is the only option on the table. Let's ask those who are criticizing putting a price on pollution what they plan to put in place instead and what their expected cost should be. Scheer says his own plan is coming. In the meantime, he's trying to place the Liberals' carbon pricing system at the forefront of the upcoming federal election campaign. I believe it's going to be very important because people are, are seeing that it's not an environmental plan and the, the concern about how high it's going to go. But will it stick? Um, this pollster it says it's a possibility. For a large chunk of the, of the electorate, yes, it will be a defining issue. And that could be enough to swing votes. If the plan is perceived to be a tax and too expensive and uh, not, you know, not really achieving any, any measurable goals, that will be the Tories' uh, opportunity. The issue already has Canadians talking. I don't think it would be fair because um, they're already taking so much taxes from us. We've got great-grandchildren that we're trying to protect. And we want this environment to be as good as it is and, and hopefully much better than it is today. Like it may take a decade or two, but it's a long run. I think, yeah, this is a good experiment and it's a really good initiative. One that's likely to have a big influence at the ballot box. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Toronto. Here are some of the other stories we're watching tonight, beginning on the East Coast. In many parts of the Maritimes, the day began with snow and wind gusts. Environment Canada issuing special weather statements, warning of icy roads, slippery sidewalks, heavy rain and strong winds. Blizzard and extreme cold warnings are also in place for parts of Newfoundland and Labrador. <laughs> Astonishing images out of Russia after a baby boy was found gravely injured but alive after 35 hours under the rubble of a partially collapsed building. Rescue teams locating the infant when they heard his cries amid the ruins. At least nine people were killed when a gas leak sparked an explosion early on Monday morning that ripped into the building. More than 30 residents remain unaccounted for. Still ahead on tonight's National, we go deep into the heart of BC's Fraser River. How a fight over land use could forge the future for fish. It is potentially the most productive salmon, sturgeon, steelhead river in the entire world. Fishing and forestry, two pillars of British Columbia's economy and identity. But sometimes those industries come into conflict. Greg Rasmussen takes us out on the Fraser River, where what's happening along the shore may be threatening some of the province's salmon runs. 
far from the roads and highway lookouts or on part of the Fraser River few get to see. Environmental groups say it's vital habitat for young fish. Hundreds of millions of young salmon rear in and around these islands and during high water actually on the islands. So the environmental values here are immense. Here, let me just bring you a little closer here. We land at Strawberry Island, part of an 80 kilometer long section of river valued for its protective natural shoreline. This was all heavily treed with cottonwood. This just gives you an idea of the scale of the clear cutting that's taken place here. It's been, it's been massive. And it's One of Canada's leading river experts and conservationists, Mark Angelo, labels the area the heart of the Fraser. We think there has to be a plan to secure, protect. He says it's vital to the river's future. This is a huge issue. When you look at the extent of the damage being done as seen behind me, and to know that that's occurring in the midst of the most productive stretch of river in our entire country, then that qualifies this, in our view, as the most urgent river issue in all of Canada. The fear is logging will lead to erosion, destroying vital areas where fish shelter during high waters. The Federal Department of Fisheries recently concluded some of the work has already damaged fish habitat on two of the islands. They've ordered corrective measures and say charges are possible. The B.C. government says it's aware of the issue, but so far hasn't taken any action because the land has been privately held for decades. The owners want to turn the forest into this, fields for berries and other valuable crops in an area where land is in short supply. One of the farmers developing the land didn't want to do an on-camera interview. He told me he agrees fish are important, but he said, so is using the land to produce food. Sport fishing for giant sturgeon is also worth millions of dollars every year. And river guides like Dean Work fear those valuable endangered fish will suffer if development continues. It is potentially the most productive salmon, sturgeon, steelhead river in the entire world. There is nothing more sacred to me than this entire river and all of its habitat. In addition to farming, a proposal to build bridges to the islands raises fears of additional environmental impacts and ever greater development. If we can find a way to protect this area, it's so important. That will be one of the great conservation milestones in the history of our country. Conversely, if we fail, uh, that would be like a shot to the heart of this great river. We're uh, working with governments and potential donors. Buying the islands back in order to protect them has been floated, but so far, a deal remains elusive. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, on the Fraser River. Still ahead on tonight's National, he spent his life preparing to wear the crown. Prince Charles turned 70 recently. We'll take a look at what kind of king he might be. I always think he's light years ahead of everybody else in terms of his thinking and seeing the bigger picture. When you're a royal, nothing says happy birthday quite like a 41-gun salute. Prince Charles got the whole package when he turned 70 in November. There were several parties, a gala at the Palladium, and a new family portrait. Charles has spent a lifetime in waiting for a job that he was born to do. In time, he'll succeed his mother and become king, but the transition is already quietly underway. Recently, Thomas Dagler looked ahead to what kind of king the future Charles III will be. It would be easy to believe Prince Charles can be defined by the ups and downs of his love life or by all those stories of family drama. But he usually has plenty more on his mind. I always think he's light years ahead of everybody else in terms of his thinking and seeing the bigger picture. And now, well past retirement age, Charles is primed for the job made only for him, ready, perhaps, to redefine the crown itself. He's dealing with stuff that a lot of politicians find sometimes a little bit sensitive. Where better to learn about the future king's priorities than in the Scottish countryside? At an 18th century estate inspired and directed by Charles himself. 
This is a 2,000 acre property with sprawling fields and buildings. It was all going to be sold off in 2007 until Prince Charles heard about it and had a vision. He brokered a deal worth more than $90 million to save the estate known as Dumfries House. Then Charles turned it into an experiment of sorts using his own principles. Employment, education, and sustainability. All the prince's ingredients blend together in the Dumfries House kitchen. Today, they're prepping a meal for 600 guests. It's a colossal job, especially when dealing with royal demands. Just ask executive chef Tom Scoble. The prince is very concerned with, with uh, the sustainability. Uh, he obviously is as organic as we can, if we can. Um, and it is very important to him. That means those veggies come right from the property or nearby. And yes, that's local meat as well. This kitchen acts as part catering service, part workforce college, where aspiring chefs sign up for training. Kim Monahan took the five-week session, then got a job out of it. I was jobless, and I was a single mum, and the course gave me a lot of confidence and a lot of belief in myself. That's kind of the goal through this whole place, to slash unemployment and empower the local community reinvigorating the textile industry through skill development. So this is their little nest boxes. This is where they all come to lay their eggs. And yes. teaching school kids about rare animal breeds, such as the Scots Dumpy Hen and the delightful Tamworth Pig. Some of the things that we are doing here, he was saying 30 years ago or 40 years, the special thing about Dumfries House is that you can actually physically see what he was talking about. Kenneth Dunsmuir runs the Prince's Foundation and keeps Charles informed of what goes on here with a report every Friday. He genuinely cares and is absolutely almost impatient to make a difference to people's lives. And I think to ultimately have a monarch who has that as part of his DNA that's ingrained in him is just would be phenomenal. <laughs> In London, behind all the pomp and pageantry, the old guard at Buckingham Palace is slowly making room for the next man in charge. Down the street, the current resident of Clarence House, Charles, is being handed the reins of royal power. He's already receiving all government papers and is said to meet with the Queen every week in private without butlers or aides, a sort of handover briefing from one head of state to another. She's going to be a tough act to follow, but I think that they're trying, and you know, the Queen is trying at this moment, with the working with the Prince of Wales, to make the, the, that transition as seamless as possible. Elizabeth doesn't travel overseas anymore, so her son has picked up the slack, representing the Queen on more foreign visits than any other royal, solo or with his wife Camilla. Just in his 70th year, he's flown to the Caribbean, then down under, and to West Africa, usually drawing attention to the plight of the environment, but never shying away from any photo op the locals will have him do. I mean, this was in the Borneo jungle, which was amazing. As the prince approached this milestone birthday, longtime royal reporter Robert Jobson followed him around and got rare insight into the future king's thinking for a book about Charles at 70. I don't think you're going to see quite so many people on that balcony when it comes to big occasions. I think it'll be a core of Charles, his family. I think it'll be William and Harry and their children. But I think it is probably time to slim down the monarchy. I think that's what the Prince of Wales will do. There's no question Charles has strong opinions, as opposed to his mother, who's always kept the world guessing about what she really thinks. Take, for instance, modern architecture and the case of Britain's National Gallery. It was set for a big extension in 1984, except Charles despised the plan, and he let it be known. What is proposed seems to me like a monstrous carbuncle on the face of a much loved and elegant friend. 
three decades later, the extent of his secret government lobbying came into sharp focus. Britain's Supreme Court allowed the release of the prince's letters to cabinet ministers advocating for singular issues such as alternative medicine and a badger call. Jobson writes that as king, Charles would have cautioned then Prime Minister Tony Blair against hurriedly invading Iraq in 2003. Those meetings would have been harder for the Prime Minister because he still has a role to play to explain to the King why he wants to take a country to war, and I don't think it would have been that easy. Um, unbelievable if I think about the stereotype that was. Jonathan Porritt has advised Charles on environmental issues for decades. He acknowledges the Prince's views on some matters aren't universally accepted. Constitutionally speaking, he's going to have to be much more careful about how he articulates some of these things. Was there any point ever where you had to say, uh, with respect, um, <laughs> Your Highness, I disagree with you on that point? Prince of Wales enjoys a good debate about many of these issues, and they're not uncontroversial. So what happens if he oversteps his boundary? That's the focus of the play King Charles III presented at his alma mater, the University of Cambridge. The Queen is dead. Long live the King. That's me. In the title role, 21-year-old law student, Ferdinand Hawley. Changing all of my vowels to fit Charles's very, very posh voice has been difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Written in Shakespearean blank verse, the play explores a future in which King Charles refuses to sign a bill into law. Use my royal prerogative to hear us all this parliament at once. Setting off a constitutional crisis and riots in the streets. We don't know whether it's gonna go down like that. Having said that, I do worry about what will happen when the queen dies. Um, Charles is an opinionated figure. Hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! In this hip, alternate hip. universe, Kate oh, pulls the strings. I am Republican! I am your beautiful! And Harry dates a Republican. Oh, and the ghost of Diana shows up as well. Such pain, my son. Spoiler alert, in the end, Charles abdicates and William takes over. My son, God save you. It may all be made up, but the move would actually be welcomed by a sizable portion of Brits. Opinion polls here consistently rank Charles among the least popular royals. He has got the point, clearly. Political writer Geoffrey Wheatcroft fears a real constitutional crisis. He says he won't be a meddling king. Even with Charles's recent pledge not to meddle in government affairs as king. The great secret of the constitutional monarchy is that the uh, the, 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 the monarch has no opinions, not trying to be ominous. I think that the monarchy might not survive the reign of King Charles III. Charles has been waiting his whole life to ascend the throne, and it could still be years away. He's accomplished plenty as a prince, and only he knows what he'll do as king. Thomas Dagle, CBC News, London. We've been taking a look at some of the most powerful images of the year this holiday season, going behind the lens to hear from the people who captured those pictures. Tonight, videographer J.F. Bisson talks about his work with Adrian in South America, covering the chaos of people fleeing Venezuela. Sometimes you know a moment's about to happen that you don't need to shoot all the other moments going on around you. You concentrate on that moment. All right, let's do this. went to Venezuela border with Adrian Arsenault and Michel Gagnon, uh, my producer, and we went to cover the uh, Venezuelan migrants crossing the border into Colombia. And once people crossed the border, they would now head into the, the mountains of Colombia to start walking north. And um, we got to a point where these two women with their two children sitting on the road in front of this checkpoint. And we were kind of surprised. And the police were kind of standing there and surrounding them and kind of realized what's going on here. And we found out that later on that the police officers were being very sympathetic 
to this family. Me habían dicho que, que nos iban a... And what they did is at their checkpoint, they decided to put their, their vehicles and their motorcycles in kind of a shape to protect them from the traffic. And also, they brought food to them. I'll always remember the face of the little girl when she got the chicken. And, uh, and her face just lit up. Picking a moment when there's a lot going on. It, it is very hard sometimes when a lot is going on. Those extra pair of eyes that I have are, you know, uh, Michelle and Adrian on this shoot uh, that are helping me out and letting me know what else is going on because, yeah, the, that other moment might be going on behind me and you miss it. Twenty-eighteen in pop culture was about rage, and while I would love for that to go away, it just isn't. But today is day one of 2019. My pop culture New Year's resolution in 2019 is to consume media the way I did when I was actually 19. I'm Donovan Bennett, host and staff writer for Sportsnet. I'm Sarah Bosveld, senior writer at Chatelaine. I'm Stephen Marsh, a random Toronto writer. I think like a lot of people, the pop culture I'm craving in 2019 is an escape from the outrage, a sort of, you know, comfort food pop culture. I, I see a lot of baking shows in my 2019. In 2019, I vow to actually watch movies in a theater, on a big screen, with special effects and a crowd. I want to enjoy things without worrying if they're trending on Twitter. I want 2019 to be a year in pop culture where diversity isn't a brave choice, but the norm. Okay, ready to rock and roll. Uh, 2018, far behind us. We have a whole other 365 days to look forward to. And so today being the start of that, let's set the table for 2019. Uh, you know our panelists well. We've got Sarah, we've got Steven, we've got Donovan. Thanks for being here. Uh, so you guys are gonna share your uh, predictions, your, your, your hopes, your dreams, your, your fears, perhaps. <laughs> a lot of feelings <laughs> going into 2019, yeah. got the it. The outpouring we're expecting here today. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and the first thing we want to do is maybe start with what you think will will make news in 2019. So, so the kind of the movement or the force that you think everyone's gonna be buzzing about this year. So Donovan, maybe we'll start with you. What do you think? Yeah, well in the in sports realm, I think it was a trend that we saw in 2018 and it's gonna be commonplace in 2019. I think brands, whether they be sports or otherwise, no longer are gonna have the luxury to be apolitical or amoral. They're going to have to choose a side. And in fact, I think they're gonna find it is lucrative to choose a side. We saw when the years virtually started around the Super Bowl, so many political ads, some even going right at the president, Donald Trump, and towards the end of the year, Colin Kaepernick having a relationship with a brand crazy, and it yeah. being a talking point. So I, I well, think- Well, Nike's big just do it, Ken. Yes, and, and the dream crazy ads. So I think no longer will brands be able to stay on the sidelines and say we want to speak to all customers. I think they're going to make a choice and hope to get that brand loyalty in return. But it's, it's funny, right? Because it's a risky play that can go one of two ways, yeah. right? And, and the example that, funny enough, that I think of is Dick's Sporting Goods. So, you know, they announce a ban on assault weapons, sales of assault weapons after the high school shooting mm -hmm. in Parkland, Florida. You know, gr granted, it, it's a bit of a different situation because yeah. that was reactive to a situation that was sort of foisted upon them. I think, mm -hmm. you know, arguably, and, and Nike and Kaepernick, that's a more proactive choice on their part. But in Dick's case, the stock prices went up. They got a nice little spike in traffic. In Nike's case, it was a bit of the opposite. I mean, th there's the big backlash against it, the just burn it campaign. You know, mm -hmm. lots of people throwing their shoes in the fire. Is 2019 going to be a messy year? I think, like, the, you know, the, the, the thing about these brands is they have no choice. They have to take a stand because politics is now aesthetics. Politics is now your pop culture choice. And pop culture, the two are just blended to such a point mm -hmm. that, you can't really do an ad campaign anymore without taking a political stand. I mean, it's funny that it's all happening in the NFL where the NFL stays so conservative, right. mm. but the brands stay so, you know, are being, you know, much more woke. It's a, it's a crazy tension, actually. Well, it's this idea of really investing in future generations of people who will buy shoes and Nike products. Yeah. And, you know, I think we discussed that on, on this panel 
way back in 2018 too <laughs> yeah. a little bit. Um, just the idea of really uh, looking much further ahead and, and Nike leading the way. And to keep the, the prognostication going, yeah. so, so your thought on 2019, what, what are you looking at? Yeah, for me, you know, because I think a lot about women's issues, you know, I know back it was 2017 now, it feels like a long time ago when, when Harvey Weinstein, um, the first news stories came out about um, his sexual uh, misconduct. Mm -hmm. And, and then, you know, it was a year after in, in 2018, but uh, Hollywood had this whole reckoning moment, and we saw that in the awards season for sure. But, but I'm really interested to see those projects greenlit by, you know, for women directors, a lot of, uh, you know, pieces of, of pop culture and, and, and films and TV series where women are portrayed as, um, you know, nuanced, complex characters, and that's not just seen as something that is, uh, uh, you know, revolutionary or, uh, you know, a flash in the pan, but that it's just normal. If you see a lot of women, uh, you know, having the, the lens of complexity and nuance and treating their characters as just basic human beings rather than what we tend to see uh, from all those sort of Hollywood stereotypes of how women are treated. I, I think that could really be a game changer. Well, the keyword is audience, right? I think yeah. what you're getting to the point is that women have been treated like a niche genre. Right, and we're half the population, yeah. excuse me. And, and, and over half of the, the consumer as far as buying power, right? Yeah. And, and so I... I it, I, you're right, it needs to come in the ideation process. Yeah. Who's thinking of these projects? Who's in the room having the conversations so that they're not really, you know, talked down to? Stephen, well, 2019. 2019. Well, to me, think? this is going to be the year when, when Netflix essentially becomes Hollywood. And I think that's actually a really yeah. profound change that we haven't quite reckoned with. It's been happening for a while. It's though. been happening for a while, but next year they're going to make 90, mil 90 movies. Right. Um, they're essentially, I think, replacing the studio system in a, in a very, they are the, they are the deal makers. And also they're the ones make, they made Roma. And Roma is actually a really interesting case because it is going to run the table on the awards as far as I'm concerned. Um, but then the other thing is that there's a very, it, seeing it in the theater is very different than seeing it on Netflix. And this distinction I think is going to actually be a big choice for audiences. And it's going to be fascinating to see if you can see a version of the film on Netflix, but there's a better version of it available in the theater, will, will people actually go and see it? But then, wh so what do you think the Netflix play is there? I mean, you talk about well, the Netflix play is to own everything and own every <laughs> distribution channel yeah. and have access to everything that isn't. You know, it, that isn't explicitly a superhero movie, yeah. and then take over those as well. Yeah. I mean, they are playing for all of the marbles, and I think they're going to get it. Well, could you I see a Netflix big box theater? Because part Absolutely. of the relationship <laughs> with movies is eating the popcorn and yeah. and laughing and hearing Escapism, the collective not laughs. just isolationism in your home. Yeah, and and Netflix, having that, date night. But right? was that not the anti-theater model? But like, see, Roma is a really interesting case because Roma has this crazy sound design that you know you really should see it in a big theater because it has this sound design where you he you can actually hear people behind you. It's incredibly innovative and strange, which you don't get on Netflix. Speaking Don't. of audience, too, I think it's an interesting play on the part of Netflix, too, because it is a, it is a uh, Spanish language film. It's yeah. set in Mexico. It's black and white. Um, you know, it's, and it shows, it's vignettes of really domestic, like domestic life and, and shows, and even talking about in inclusivity and diversity and, and, and accessing those stories that we don't tend to often hear. You know, here's a film that really kind of gets at all of those, uh, you know, pieces that have been bubbling up in our, in our pop culture well, conversations right now. Yeah. And then, along with this sort of business idea. And I think the, the Latin markets, too, will obviously be watching this film, and that's a huge, huge yeah, audience as well that is very are, untapped. Well, but also right. what they have is real data. Yes, they have yes, real right. analytics. Yeah, because that, they can see it all. Exactly, yeah. and shows what does well to diverse audiences and what doesn't. So but sadly, the rest of the public doesn't have access to. Right? Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's, why, that's why Disney but, should be really worried. Right. Because, like, this is, this is the future in a lot of ways. Okay. I, I do want to move on here because I want, if we could zoom in almost in a way and, and talk about people. So, uh, you know, maybe people we ought to be watching for in 2019 or, or people who maybe on the, on the flip side you wish would, would just go away and that you <laughs> didn't have to see again uh, for another year. How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you're, you're, it might take all year. You're a, you're a bright, positive person, Donovan. So, wow. so start us off. A lot on of pressure. The, <laughs> the person you think we ought to watch. Uh, watch Ellen DeGeneres, and we have uh, been watching her. We've been watching her been very specifically. Time. Yes, yeah. 16 years. It's crazy. Um, she's had her daytime show, and she's back uh, as far as stand-up for the first time uh, after 15 years. R relatable as stand-up on Netflix. It's, yeah. it's very good. And the interesting thing is, she now has a choice, and she's talked openly about it. 
that do I want to be the dancing person over a coffee table right. and give everyone their comfort food when we need it in these times? Or should I be speaking truth to power? Should I be speaking on these serious issues, which Ellen, who's very bright, very interesting, and has her own backstory, could lend a hand to? She has a real choice. She's, she's now 60, which is crazy to think. Is she 60 wow. years yes. old? And so whatever this next chapter will be, is it a streaming service? Is it breaking down the, the barriers and going to late night and making that yeah. more diverse? Right doing none of that, but still ruling the world like Oprah after her daytime yeah. show. Yeah. I think this next chapter is going to be super fascinating. She has a lot of Oprah potential. <laughs> she should just, they should just give her the Tonight Show. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay. okay. that's all I'll do. <laughs> yeah. Stephen, I want to keep things moving. Uh, I'll let you take your pick. Do you, uh, someone we ought to watch or someone that, that should... Same person. I, For both. I, yes. <laughs> I want to really watch them, I and I also want them to go away. It's Kanye West, the subject of fascination, the gotcha, subject of obsession. Gotcha. And yeah, I mean, the, the spectacle of his intimate collapses and rebirths and uh, the fact that, you know, next year he could make one of the greatest albums of all time, or he could, you know, insult everyone on the planet Earth, and he could do those same things in the same week. Uh, you know, I don't think we've <laughs> yeah. really had a pop culture figure this omnipresent since Charlie Chaplin, and um, it's, it's both painful and uh, incredibly enjoyable to watch. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I, I really hope the best for him though this year. Yeah. I hope it's a better year this yeah. year. Okay, and, and, and Sarah, uh, continue that, that, that sentiment <laughs> anyway. So, he so went on a spectrum of like, you're really lovely <laughs> to like. I know. Uh, this is what was not intentional. <laughs> I go into so I'm going to sound like a monster here. And I wish them well and all the happiness, but I'm so sick of the royals, like Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. In, particular you weddings. know this 2018 yeah. uh, in the it's past a lovely time for the it world. was a lovely time but I feel you know and it's this great kind of we, we've claimed a lot of connection to it in Canada too like there are sort of Canadian royals because she lived in Toronto once I don't know but the idea too that we sh you know everything sucks and this is like can we just have this one nice thing of like being so invested in this couple's happiness is just an annoying concept to me and you know and I know that they're not going to go away because they are expecting a child yep. to which I was like that's very exciting and you should all follow your own family trajectory but I mean you know, Kensington Palace is very excited to progress the narrative of their new relevant uh, couple, and I think they're just going to continue to be in our faces. And I just think they should just go be happy and private. I don't need to care. The entire Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> All the just mail and tweets. Yeah, that's I know. why I was like right? the horrible Zero. person on yeah. the end. We've got time. Fifteen <laughs> seconds each for predictions. Twenty nineteen. Uh, who wants to start us up? Do you want to? Do you Ooh, want to I'll start. There's this woman um, you may not have heard of, but you know the song. Um, uh, it's called The Middle. Uh, yes. Zed and Marin Morris I, is the woman I, I would I, like I, you to watch. I think we have it. Yeah, let's just play a little snippet. Oh, baby. Why don't you just meet me in the middle? I'm losing my mind just a little. So why don't you just meet me in the middle? In the middle. Definitely catchy. Well, mm -hmm. yes. she just got what it takes. She's the next Taylor Swift, hands down. Whoa. I'm calling it now. Okay. Bold uh, claim. <laughs> Donovan. Uh, Disney's most watched trailer in the first 24 hours, The Lion King. It is oh, yeah. back. It's going to be back in a big way. Uh, Elton John with his famous tracks coming back. <laughs> Who doesn't want to see Simba in Why CGI? You, I <laughs> well, it's just, I so are you kidding me? I rarely feel the Can you not feel the love gap. tonight? I cannot feel the love Beyonce tonight. Beyonce. Matata, too. my friend. They're going to be awful. All these live action <laughs> no, remakes. No, no, gonna, no, no. It's going to no. be one no. horrible no. live action remake. Give this to Donovan. Let him have this. Thank you. Stephen, take us home. Well, I just, I think I'm going to be watching a lot of baking shows. I think everyone is. 2019 is the year when the American next American election begins. So that's what this year is going to be about. And in the middle of all of that outrage and horror, I think we're going to need to have straight comfort pop culture. Reruns, friends reruns, baking shows, you know, that sort of thing. Steven's 20... going to be in his little cocoon, yes. like, obsessing when over tart be. making yeah. and 2019, pies. the year of the baking show. Yes. Uh, we Keep shall see. Guys, always fun. Happy New Year, by the way. Happy New, New Year. Thanks for having us. I remember when I hosted the pop culture, but that's so... 2018. Uh, it was a wonderful start, by the way, to the new year for one young couple. The birth of their baby boy is our moment of the day, but it wasn't without controversy. I really like cute. Just, just cute. I, is that horrible? <laughs> <laughs> really? <Yeah. laughs> 
At the stroke of midnight on this first day of 2019, countries around the world began welcoming New Year's babies. UNICEF says more than 395,000 will be born today alone. And that includes Dominic Soswa here in British Columbia. He was born at 1201 at Royal Columbian Hospital in New Westminster, and that's just outside Vancouver, weighing a healthy eight pounds, three ounces. And BC's first baby of 2019 is our moment of the day. As soon as he came out, all the nurses were calling around and they said, well, we think you're number one. And, uh, <laughs> and we were. Dominic's parents knew they'd be spending New Year's in the hospital. Yeah. They had arrived Monday morning when mom went into labor, but things weren't progressing quickly enough, so doctors opted for a C-section. I feel great. Yeah, the, the, from the time we got here to now, every, everyone's been so lovely. I'd do it again tomorrow. <laughs> it was actually quite, quite nice. But for Dominic's dad, an orthopedic surgeon, it was tough to sit on the sidelines. When we were taking her for a C-section, I, I was just following and we go, no, 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 you're just, you're just the dad today. And so <laughs> I felt a little awkward because I'm just used to walking in there and kind of, you know, setting up shop. After some debate, the couple settled on a name which dad admits is better than his first choice. I really like Q, just, just Q. I, is that horrible? <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being honest. <laughs> well, that confirms that those were the horrible names. So I'm, I guess I'm glad we said all of them. So we know there were first babies in provinces and territories all across the country and all the time zones, but we thought we'd pick Dominic as the representative first baby as we look forward to all the things in 2019 and beyond. And, and just keep this in mind. I don't know if this should make you feel old or young, but Dominic will be graduated from high school in 2037.